a historic chance for peace after almost 30 years of conflict. The jailed Kurdish leader has raised hopes by calling on his fighters to leave Turkey. But will this ceasefire succeed where others have failed? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Hazm Seeker. Let guns be silenced and politics dominate. The words of Abdullah Ocalan, the jailed leader of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, as he called for a historic truce. Thousands gathered to listen to him on Thursday as he called on his PKK fighters to put down their weapons and withdraw from Turkey. The announcement is part of a peace process designed to end one of the world's longest running conflicts, one that's killed 40,000 people. But as Kurdistan celebrates its new year, can the two sides maintain peace after almost 30 years of fighting? Well, let's take a closer look then. In 1984, the PKK took up arms against Ankara, waging a war in the southeast where there's a Kurdish majority. The first insurgency lasted until 1999, when Ocalan was captured and sentenced to death for treason. The PKK then withdrew its demand for an independent Kurdish state, calling instead for more autonomy. Three years later, in 2002, Ocalan had his death sentence commuted to life. But between 2004 and 2007, the second insurgency began when the PKK increased its ambushes and bomb attacks. The PKK has called several ceasefires since Ocalan's capture, but violence rose sharply between June 2011 and late last year. Recent attempts at peace have been more successful, though. Kurdish rebels last week released eight Turkish prisoners. Well, joining us now to talk more about this are our three guests in Istanbul, Abdul Hamid Belici. He's the general manager of the Chihan News Agency in Turkey. In Brussels, Ian Lesser, senior director and foreign and security policy at the German Marshall Fund. He's also written a number of books on Turkey and the Mediterranean. And joining us from London, Ibrahim Dogus. He's a Kurd and a, and a director of the Center for Turkey Studies and Development. Good to have you all uh, with us. Uh, Ibrahim Dogus. I, I want to start uh, with you, if I can. Um, this is the result of uh, uh, 30 years of, of, of conflict, um, but there have been many uh, false starts uh, in this process, but it does seem as though there's real hope now uh, for, for a historic opportunity uh, to end this conflict. Why now? I mean, uh, the, the process um, has begun uh, after 10 years of AK Party government, uh, purely because previous governments were not in full control of the institutions in Turkey. So it was really difficult for them to make such a big decision and uh, reconcile uh, with the Kurds, um, go forward to a peaceful solution and create a new alliance with the Kurdish public in Turkey, but also in other neighboring countries for a better future of Turkey and, and the region. So I think um, purely uh, because of that, but also because Kurds have matured and they have realized that they have a better future to, to be in Turkey to, or to live together with Turks. Abdul Hamid Bilici, what does this announcement mean to you? Uh, this is an historic opportunity. Indeed, it is a bit late announcement because this problem, the PKK problem, uh, was born as a reaction to authoritarian uh, policies of uh, early 1980s. So this uh, movement emerged as a reaction to those uh, somehow nationalist, somehow racist policies of the then uh, coup d'etat in 1980s. So Turkey of today is so much different from Turkey of 1980s. And uh, I, I think we should start uh, much before uh, talking on a settlement of that crisis and the PKK issue. And indeed, the government started, this government started three years ago. Uh, as, as you would remember, uh, there was an effort to start a dialogue uh, in Oslo. Uh, but it was sabotaged uh, by some uh, forces within PKK uh, by an attack in Silvan. And this was also uh, a very big uh, opportunity missed uh, three years ago. But now what is different is, uh, I mean, it is hopeful that Öcalan could have a final say on a PKK movement, the terrorist organization, because 
uh, it is uh, divided. There are different opinions within the PKK. So it is, uh, I mean, I hope and uh, wish that uh, Öcalan could have really a final say with this statement today. And uh, the second uh, very important factor is, for the first time in decades, uh, Ankara is able to speak with one voice. It is the voice of democracy, it is the voice of openness, and it is a, a brave effort to solve the problem by uh, talking uh, with the people who are responsible for, for the problem. Ian Lesser, as we said, this is being seen as a historic uh, opportunity for peace for, for both sides, but there are no quick fixes here, are there? Well, no. I mean, I would agree with all with what has already been said. This is really a historic development, and it has a basis in uh, in uh, really the success of Turkish society over the last decade. Certainly, uh, this is a very different Turkey. It's also a very different Turkish relationship with northern Iraq, which I think is part of this equation as, as well. The relationship that's grown up between Turkey and the Kurdish regional government in the north of Iraq. The fact that Turkey is a very important economic and even political actor in the north of Iraq. Uh, all of this has changed the context for this uh, for this conflict and it is historic uh, what is on the table now um, is it certain that it will succeed no but I think this is a very big step uh, we'll have to see surely there will be elements I would on both sides if I can put it that way uh, who will uh, not be as enthusiastic about a settlement uh, but I think for a number of reasons structural reasons that have already been mentioned this stands a, a good chance of succeeding and it really would be transforming for the region and for Turkey. Ibrahim, how credible is this uh, ceasefire given previous uh, declarations that haven't uh, ended in, in a, a, a lasting solution? Why, th why are things different this time I mean, around? I mean, I think we are um, observing a creation of a new alliance in the region between Kurds and Turks. Um, Kurdish insurgency in Turkey of, of the last 30 years has, um, has realized that the way forward for both uh, nations or both people in the, in the region is to, is to get together, act together, and make sure that their common um, ground, the, you know, the common sort of interest, would be uh, taken care of by both sides. And th this ceasefire has a big difference because in 1993 uh, and uh, consequently afterwards, all the ceasefires were declared unilaterally by the PKK forces, by the Kurdish insurgency. But now demand has been raised by the Prime Minister and by uh, the, the, ex the current AK Party government, they have demanded that uh, there would be, uh, you know, that the, that the Kurdish insurgents would declare a ceasefire, and uh, consequ you know, subsequently they will withdraw from Turkish, uh, you know, the territory, and they will probably move into Kandil Mountains. So it is a, a new historical moment um, in the history of Kurds and Turks. So I believe. Um, purely beca because of that, there will be uh, a bigger chance of the ceasefire to live uh, longer than the previous ones, and hopefully, um, with with an official or unofficial cease of fire by the Turkish army or cease of operations by the Turkish army, which would help a lot uh, for the ceasefire to 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 live uh, longer than expected. And hopefully, once the the Kurdish fighters are withdrawn withdrawn from Turkey, then uh, there will be a bigger opportunity for politics. Uh, to play a bigger role in a solution to Kurdish question in Turkey. Abdul Hamid, how, how important is this moment for uh, the Turkish Prime Minister uh, Erdogan and his uh, AK party? Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, he is uh, a politician. And, and is there a certain amount of political calculation going on here? Uh, of course, it is a very significant uh, development for Prime Minister Erdogan and for his party because uh, to take the risk uh, of talking with the leader of PKK, uh, who has been responsible for killing more than 40,000 uh, Kurds and Turks, was a very big risk. And uh, Prime Minister Erdogan uh, took that risk. For a politician, it was a brave act indeed. So anything, any problem that could uh, come out in the way could be maybe uh, very uh, detrimental for his uh, success. But of course, if you take big risk, you can gain big as well. I mean, if uh, the process goes smoothly and uh, Turkey achieves a kind of settlement and PKK disarms and uh, leave terror aside, 
that would be very big success uh, for uh, for Erdogan and uh, this is because this is a historic uh, problem of Turkey and it is defined as the biggest problem and the big the biggest challenge of Turkey so to solve that problem will earn lots of uh, grades and uh, prestige for for Prime Minister Erdogan because uh, he is uh, indeed uh, serving Turkey for 10 years and this will be a kind of king maker for for him but of course it depends all on all uh, implementation I mean if these promises and the call by uh, PKK leader Öcalan is accepted and implemented uh, by, by the various uh, factions within PKK. And if we could come to a point that uh, PKK accepts disarming itself, that would even uh, give uh, the chance for uh, Prime Minister Erdogan to get a Nobel Prize, because this is a very important problem, not just for Turkey, but for, for the region as well. Ian Lesser, um, we saw some pictures there of the uh, jailed uh, uh, Kurdish leader earlier, uh, Abdullah Öcalan, who was the, the, the man who, uh, the, 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 annou the announcement uh, that was made uh, on Thursday came uh, from him. So he's clearly, despite the fact that he has uh, been in jail now for uh, something like 15 years, he clearly um, has a great deal of influence uh, on the Kurdish people in Turkey and on this process as a whole. But how, how much influence does he have on the PKK, given the fact that he uh, has been in jail for, for this long? Well, he obviously still is a, is a figure of some more than symbolic importance uh, for all sides in this. Uh, otherwise, I don't think this process would have uh, gone as far as it already has. Um, does he still have the same role that he might have had uh, 15 years ago? Obviously, it's different. Um, I think many analysts of the problem, uh, especially outside of Turkey, have pointed to the fact uh, that uh, there is in, indeed a younger generation of uh, of Kurds and Turks who do look at this problem in a slightly different way, um, including some who may still feel alienated and unwilling to go along with this kind of a process. So, uh, but I think the the very important point is that uh, Abdullah Öcalan still clearly has a degree of sway over the. Um, over the uh, direction of forces in the field, uh, as it were, that the PKK deploys within Turkey. I would also make the other point that you know, this is not just a, an issue about Turkish security. It will also potentially have far-reaching consequences if it goes ahead uh, for dynamics with Syria, with Iran, um, and more generally. Uh, I think uh, Turkey is worried not only about the PKK insurgency on its own territory, uh, but the role of the PKK and related groups in Syria, uh, the role that Iran or Syria uh, might play in terms of using the PKK as a proxy. Um, if this uh, disengagement goes ahead, uh, then that uh, very severe challenge to Turkish security might be removed. Well, let's get more of a uh, geographic perspective on this now and tell you more about uh, who the Kurds are and where they are. They have tried to set up an independent state in a number of neighboring countries. An estimated 15 to 20 million Kurds live in the border areas around Turkey, Armenia, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Ibrahim Dogus, um, obviously the, the focus of this particular discussion is going to be the, the, the Kurds uh, in Turkey, but um, as we showed on that map there, there, there are Kurdish uh, people in, scattered throughout this region in a number of uh, countries bordering Turkey. What implications is this going to have for them? I mean, uh, before I go on to that, let me um, say a few things about uh, credit. Uh, you know, let me say a few things about Mr. Erdogan's um, and Mr. Erdogan's sort of uh, braveness on, on this topic. Uh, yes, we are all right to give credit to uh, Prime Minister Erdogan for his brave attempts to resolve the Kurdish question, but we should also consider uh, that Mr. Erdogan has also been very brave in terms of declaring an end to an armed conflict in, in Turkey. So it, it's, it is, in a way, um, at the, it is the dialogue between Mr. Erdogan and Mr. Erdogan through intermediaries that th this process has been moving on. Uh, we all know um, that uh, the Kurdish insurgency in Turkey is also very well organized in Syria. So because uh, they used to, you know, they used to be based in Syria, uh, they used to be organized um, amongst the Syrian Kurdish population, but also they're uh, very actively um, uh, organized in uh, Iran, within the Iranian Kurdish uh, population. So this attempt 
to resolve um, the, the Kurdish question in Turkey with peaceful means will have a huge impact on Syria and on Iran. That's why we should, you know, the, the, the both sides, both Kurds and the Turks, should be very um, careful uh, in terms of possible, uh, possible sort of sabotages or attempts to derail the peace process, which might come from uh, those neighboring countries, purely, you know, uh, simply because um, this uh, this peace process, uh, if it's end, if it ends with uh, a, an equality or uh, in a proper democratic uh, country where Kurds and Turks are happily living together, then this will reach out to Kurds in Syria, in Iraq and also uh, into the Kurds, um, Kurds, to the Kurds in, in Iran. So both Syrian uh, regime and Iranian authorities would not be very happy to, to, to see an end to the Kurdish conflict in Turkey. But at the same time, Iraqi central government might not be too keen on seeing an end uh, to the Kurdish conflict in, in Turkey. Simply, you know, again, because the, the relations between Kurdistan regional government and the, the AK Party government okay. has been so good uh, on All that. Right. Ian Lesser, what, what do you think this means for Kurdish identity throughout the region? Well, I mean, this is really for uh, Kurds themselves to say, but just as an outside analyst, I think this does open up a new chapter. If it goes ahead, if it's successful, I think it'll allow a much less uh, a charged, uh, a much more positive discussion about how uh, cultural and political rights uh, economic opportunity, how all of these things are at the top of the agenda rather than uh, simply uh, an armed struggle. Uh, and I think that will change the dynamics. It will also change the way uh, Turkey's Western partners see the Kurds in the region. Uh, and I think all for, uh, all for the good. I think it's a very positive development uh, if, as we've been discussing, it can be consolidated. Abdul Hamid, this was a bitterly fought war uh, over the last uh, three decades, and, and obviously feelings are, are still very raw uh, on both sides. How much is that going to factor into to any peace deal here? Because there will undoubtedly be uh, people on both sides uh, who are, are, are not comfortable with the fact that there's going to be a certain amount of, of, of reconciliation here um, for those responsible for the violence. I mean, before going that, I'd like to just add something on the regional perspective. You know, this issue, sure, the Kurdish ahead. problem, was, was always a headache for Turkey in dealing with neighbors like Syria, uh, Iraq, and Iran. So to get rid of that headache would ease Turkey to have normal relations, to have better relations with neighbors. So that would be very, very important uh, progress for, for Turkey, for Turkey's normalization. In, in foreign policy and, of course, in uh, domestic policy. But uh, to, to, to your question, uh, I, I guess uh, Turkey and Turkish people, of course, included Kurdish uh, people, are fed up with this uh, armed conflict for, for 30 years. You know, Turkey lost more than 40,000 of its uh, children and we lost uh, more than $300 billion and it, so this is a very big uh, problem uh, for 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 whole Turks living in this country. So this is, I mean, uh, I mean, when I look at the people's psychology, they think that anyway, uh, it's better to have peace and settlement than continuing the crisis. So I mean, uh, I, I, I'm sure that people will give enough credit to reach uh, settlement. And very important thing is, is that uh, the crisis, this PKK problem, is not a problem between Turks and Kurds of Turkey. It was a problem between some parts of the Kurds and the regime, which was authoritarian. So it was indeed a function of Turkey's democracy, lack of democracy. Since Turkey is getting democratized, giving lots of rights to its citizens, and in a process of writing a new first time civilian constitution. So it is, it, I mean, I am hopeful that with this democratization process, with this normalization process, Turkey could be able to solve, to handle uh, that problem of PKK as well. Of course, the Kurd Turkey's good relations with the northern Iraq is an important element in, in that. In the past, uh, you could remember uh, these relations were not that much helping. Now, this is an important asset in the hand of Turkey to encourage uh, PKK elements in that right. part of uh, Iraq 
to, to, to be for, for settlement and to work in line with disarmament and for, for democratic let's, um, solution. Let's get some reaction now from uh, our Facebook page, which we, uh, when we posted this uh, topic on the page there. Sandy Ezzo says, any nation who has language, culture, history, and land needs to have itself needs to have self-government, free Kurdistan for Kurdish people. And Clayton O'Bear says both sides may mean well, but will a little more regional autonomy change people's lives enough that they give up aspirations of a Kurdistan? Iraq would clearly fight a civil war to hold on to its Kurdish territories. Grim prospects, but promising statements and actions so far. Um, Ibrahim Dogus, uh, I want to put this to you uh, and, and, and focus on the, the, the point that was made in that um, uh, last uh, Facebook post. Um, specifically, what, what, you, what the Kurdish people in Turkey would be looking for is, is a greater or, or autonomy rights, uh, uh, rights to, their, to learn their own language in schools and that sort of thing. And the, the, the question of independence is not part of this equation. Is that something that uh, the Kurdish people in Turkey are going to be uh, comfortable with settling with years from now if there is a peace settlement? I think so. I mean, um, what would be uh, the key thing for the Kurdish community in Turkey is to be counted as equal citizens under a newly drafted civilian uh, constitution. If that is achieved, which hopefully would be achieved at some point soon, uh, before 2014's presidential elections, uh, that will help a lot because uh, the other demands such as linguistic rights, cultural rights, education in mother tongue and so on would come after that. But I think the Turkish authorities are also maturing and they are also beginning to realize that uh, granting basic human rights, basic cultural and linguistic rights to the Kurdish population in, in Turkey is not going to end up in, uh, in a separation. It's not going to lead into a separate Kurdish state. As uh, Kurdish leader Öcalan put it uh, quite clearly in his statement to today's Navro celebrations in Diyarbakir, that he is no longer interested in a separate state for statehood for Kurds. He is more into a unitary, sort of a united um, common uh, land where Kurds, Turks, Arabs, um, Farsi people and so on are able to live together side by side, which is, I think, is the beginning of a new alliance and a creation of a new alliance between Turks and Kurds, which will lead into sort of um, a bigger union in the region where people will be, uh, you know, will, will get rid of the authoritarian regimes uh, and they will be able to live under a democratic uh, sort of union or democratic uh, states uh, within, the, within the same neighborhood. Ian Lester, if this uh, is a process that will end in, in a lasting peace, if this succeeds, what needs to happen? What is the most important thing to you? Well, I, I think uh, there, is, there, there are a couple of different pieces there. Some of them we've mentioned already. Uh, there, there needs to be some uh, process of reconciliation whereby uh, all of the, this history of the last decades of violence can somehow be accommodated I in the society, uh, and in the society in Turkey, but also in uh, adjoining societies. And we've seen this in other places. We've seen this in Northern Ireland. Uh, we've seen it in South Africa. We've seen it in many places where this issue of reconciliation over time has been managed more or less successfully. So that's one big piece of it. I think the issue of economic development uh, for uh, the largely Kurdish areas of, or heavily Kurdish areas of the southeast of Turkey, uh, but also, of course, in northern Iraq will be a big piece of this. Uh, I think um, if there is uh, an end to this conflict, uh, people will be looking for to see uh, results in terms of economic development. And of course, the long-term consolidation of, of political rights and cultural rights will be uh, on the agenda as well. Uh, but we'll have to see what happens. We certainly will. I just want to give the last word very briefly in the, in the 20 seconds that we've got left. Abdul Hamid, are you ultimately optimistic that this will end in peace? Uh, I think I could call myself as cautiously optimistic because in the past there has been trials of that kind, but uh, we, some of them failed. So uh, I, I guess we should be hopeful enough and pray for the success of the process. Right. But uh, we should not forget that we should also be cautious at the same time. This is a terrorist organization. All right, and on and that there note, are we are uh, going to uh, have to leave it. Thanks to uh, all three of our guests, Abdul Hamid Bilici, Ian Lesser, and Ibrahim Dogus. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. Remember, if you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.